All right, it's about seven o'clock somewhere, so we're going to go ahead and start the uh, the call sponsored forum for the Melville School District. We'll go over a couple ground rules, how it's going to work. Each three can each of our three candidates are going to have three minutes for their opening statements. We're going to start with Larry to Kevin to Lori, and then we'll go through some questions. If you guys have any questions to submit, there's some um, recipe cards over there. B would come over and pick them up for him. You just hold them up. We already have a, quite a few questions that have been pre-submitted uh, by email. So I'm going to do my best to consolidate them to cover the main points of all of them. Every question won't get asked, uh, asked verbatim, but I'll do my best to cover them all. So we'll have two minutes then for each person to answer the question. We'll just start the same way. We'll work that way and then backwards through the questions. Deb, you're keeping time. Three minutes or two minutes? Two minutes for each, each question. Three minutes for opening statement and closing statement. Okay, I'll, I'll have to discuss that. <clears throat> and you're probably all as curious as I am, what happens if they go over the two minutes? I asked Debbie that, and she said, you don't want to know. <laughs> so <laughs> that, and we'll do the closing statement. So yeah, so, so they get a 30-second thing on the two-minute notice, too, then. then boom, exactly. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and start. Mr. Felton, you're first up. So, and it if you guys think you can't hear them all right, we can pa pass the microphone along. And if, if, if you can, well, we won't worry about it then. So let's go ahead and start and take it from there. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. Hello? Hello? Not all, Larry. There you go. That's what the ON stands for. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Larry Felt, and I'm running for the Melville School Board. First of all, I want to thank the call newspapers for putting this evening together so we have a chance to discuss the issues that you are concerned about. I'd also like to thank Mr. Helmer for taking time to be our moderator this evening and certainly uh, the, the people here at Andres for their hospitality. I've been on the board for nine years. When I ran the first time, it was because I wanted my children, they had a great opportunity at Melville and they attended there. And I wanted all the kids in this district to be able to maintain and have those same opportunities. I'm running for re-election because I was committed to that purpose today as I was then. This is really an exciting time to want to serve on the board. With what we've been able to do in the last two years, I think we've really changed the entire complexion of the district. We have a feeling of cooperation between the community and the school district that I've never seen before in the, in the 24 years I've been here. We have community members, parents, teachers, administrators working side by side for the betterment of the school district. We have a community that has listened, provided their views, and supported the district's efforts to move forward. This didn't happen by accident. This happened because board members made decisions two, two and a half years ago that really put this in motion. We heard Dr. Norm Ritter, a man with strategic planning and process improvement expertise. He made it cool to be a planner. He freed those of us that are hopelessly horizontal in our thinking. He adopted a strategic, we adopted a strategic plan that now gives the board a consistent target and the community a, a consistent set of expectations for what we should be doing. We hired Dr. Gaines, a man with proven expertise in school administration, using process improvement and other techniques. And finally, we put Prof R on the ballot, giving the community a chance to voice its opinion. I'm proud to say I supported all of these efforts with my comments, my votes, and my time. Tonight you will hear the three of us answer your questions about the Melville School District, our qualifications, our involvement with the school district, and our vision for the future. I look forward to this conversation this evening. Thank you. Hi. I'm Kevin Sharpner, and uh, I first want to thank also the call, Andres and Aaron, who I'd heard a lot about before, so. Anything good? Uh, I'll <laughs> <that's> <laughs> uh, I'm very excited to be running for the Melville School Board. I, I'm not an incumbent, obviously, this is my first time. I really think it's an exciting time in our district, having just pro passed Prop R with nearly 73% of the vote. Prop R brought our community together to restore our schools, protect our community, and now rather than another year facing budget cuts, that we're actually hurting our K-3 to children academically. We're looking at new improvements that are going to elevate our standing in the St. Louis community. We live in an amazing area. 
When you look at the rest of St. Louis, we have very little crime. We have really good schools. Second lowest property taxes in all of St. Louis County. And our people support our community when there is a well-communicated and reasonable need. Many of you know that I was a member of the Melville Local United Committee. That was the Pro Prop R Committee. It was nearly a year ago when I actively sought out this grassroots organization to help our district. I did a lot with the data. I did a lot with Facebook. Uh, some of you know that I was out selling shirts and yard signs. Met some of you out there. Uh, and I was also the treasurer. Now, when Kim Hannon West, who was our president, asked me to be treasurer, it was a natural fit for me. I've been in charge of multi million dollar budgets for most of my career. I am a fiscal conservative. Every Saturday is balanced the checkbook day. Afterwards, my family is either happy because I'm congratulating them on a great week, or I'm telling them, hey, if this keeps going, we're after, gonna, have, gonna have to figure out how to snuggle into the minivan, and that's not gonna be fun. With other people's money, I'm even more focused. Uh, something that actually the, the call verified, or I guess they had the story about it, was when we got near the end of Prop R, there was a point where I knew that we were going to have enough money to do everything that we had planned out. And I put a thing out on Facebook to all of the people that were watching MOU, and I said, if you are looking at contributing money to this, you don't have to because we're good. Now, if you still want to, I said what we would do with it for future things. But I knew where we were at. I knew it was other people's money. And I would want to know myself if I were looking at contributing to something for a purpose and it wasn't going to go there, that it wasn't going to go there. So that's the kind of person that I am. That's how I that's how I roll. What's it? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so Prop R wasn't the end of our journey to become a great school district. And that's really why I'm so excited about running for school board. We had the opportunity to set up our district academically and fiscally for many years to come. I believe I have the experience, the skills, and the energy to help our school board move this district to the next level. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lori Trakis. Thank you for inviting me to the Call Newspaper Forum. Recently, it was said to me that it only takes one match to light up a dark room. For outsiders in the education world, it can feel like you are in a dark room. However, one just needs the perseverance and desire to learn to begin creating a spark in oneself that eventually produces a glimmer of light into our educational system. I have filled up with information over the past three years through my service and look forward to sharing with you that information tonight in hopes that in you will be a small glimmer of spark to have you persevere to ask the questions that Melville needs to have asked. In the end of tonight, after you have heard the questions, you have heard the answers, I am convinced that Lori Trakis alone will be your voice for academic excellence, financial transparency, and a voice to secure traditional values in the Melville School District. On the same ballot with, with you three, there's going to be a Proposition A. And so I guess what we want to do, one of these questions is we want to ask, what is your stance on Proposition A? And I'm going to combine another question that says, if you would be opposed to it, how do you propose to pay for the roofs and HVAC systems? Okay, we'll go ahead and start. Uh, well, I am not uh, a proponent for uh, Prop A. For two reasons. The first reason is we are going to move, remove whatever small existing amount we have left to pay off our debt, which is four cents. That is going to be removed from debt service. As the night goes on, you will probably learn that I am uh, a proponent of uh, paying down debt. I do that in our household, and I think businesses work the best that way. And I think in the end, you're able to set a, a brighter vision. Uh, and so how do I propose to pay for the HVAC and roofs? Well, when Prop R was on the ballot, the ballot mandated that a portion of that money, almost about $2 million, would go towards the payment of HVAC and roofs. I am 
a supporter of Prop A, and the reason for that is because our district has about 55 million in capital needs. Um, when you look at Prop A, because we have that four cent debt retiring, this is not going to affect us as far as an increase in taxes. So we end up paying the same amount as what we were in the previous year. There is a very defined plan out there. It goes through the HVAC, it goes through the roof, roofing. It's a year by year plan laid out. It has a 10 year sunset on it. Uh, I think for the average household, it comes out to something like $12 a year. If we don't do this, we're going to continue with the old roofs that we have. We're going to continue with HVAC that is extremely inefficient. Uh, it's not that energy savings would pay for the HVAC because I don't believe that would happen, but we would have lower operational costs going forward and at some point they are going to fail. Um, this is also a pay-as-you-go proposition. With Prop A, we don't have debt. There's no debt with this. So it comes in, we pay it. It goes on to a rotating schedule. If we could all do that in our homes and we didn't have to have a home mortgage and not pay interest, we'd all do it. Uh, this is the best way to keep up with capital repairs and not waste money on interest. I am for Prop A. Um, when we look at it, from a tax levy perspective, there's no change. It's four senses been done with retiring at one debt. Now we have a chance to put this into a capital account. Because one of the things that I'm very concerned about is if we have to use long-term debt, we should be using it for buildings or major, major efforts. But if we can take the four cents, that's the beginning. It's about $630,000 that will go toward HVAC and, and large expenses. The idea over time is we would like to be able to put that into our budget and be able on an average basis know what that's going to cost and not have to be in the debt business at all. The, the money that's coming out of Prop, Prop R, if I remember correctly, goes into the maintenance line item in our operations budget, which is for routine activity. What we're doing with this four cents is to start building a capital line item to deal with very specific things and not even have to put the strain on the maintenance budget. Go ahead and hang on that microphone. While we're talking about propositions and letters, we're going to talk about Proposition R. And one of the questions is, Proposition R was approved last fall, I believe, with roughly 73% of the vote. In hindsight, have you changed your thoughts on it as far as did you support it then and do you support it now? The short answer is yes, I did. I supported Prop R. I uh, voted to put it on the ballot. I went out and worked. I sold signs, ate a lot of donuts, met a lot of people, and I voted for it. But I think the important part about talking about Prop R is what it represented. For the first time, and this was far back as I go, it was a community that asked us, we want a shot at this. We want to try this. And this started because we, we went back along, and this goes back to Dr. Ritter again, where we started a conversation with the community to find out what they thought, what we should be doing, and through focus groups and forums and surveys, we crafted a strategic plan. That was the basis for this. And Prop R was now an extension of, we've identified what our financial state is, we've advised the community, and they came to us and they asked us to put it on the ballot, and we did. I definitely supported Prop R. I had hundreds of hours into supporting Prop R. Uh, I definitely have not changed my thoughts on that. And I'm going to get into the first sec since i got two minutes. The reasons why. Um, when I first heard about the budget issues that were facing our district, I'm a data guy. I went out on the internet and I started researching data. And also Dr. Ritter had a deck of slides that had a lot of data, which was kind of where I started from. What I quickly saw was that where our budget was at, around $108 million, trying to cut about $8 million, but we only, I think we cut 4 and a half that year. Um, when you start looking at that and you start saying there's got to be waste in there, well, there probably is. There's probably waste in there. But when you're talking 84% was going for compensation, you already know that market rate-wise for teachers and administrators were lower than basically our, our St. Louis peers. And you look at it, we had 0.3% revenue growth and only 1.7% um, growth in our expenses. You start to see where we're at here is a revenue issue because we're actually controlling costs at that point revenue going up a 0.3 percent is extremely small uh, so I think we went from being in a place where we were cutting a lot of things to a place now where we're looking 
at options where we could become a destination district, this is where we want to be. We want to make sure that we have great schools, we are a destination district, and that's how our property values stay high and how we, we stay a great community. Yes, I did not support Prop R for a variety of reasons. The first reasons were practical. About four or five months before that, our former superintendent, Dr. Canos, had put forth prop proposition motion forward. This included an auditorium, this included school additions, this included new libraries, among other things. Prop R did not have any of those issues even um, addressed with the new proposition. So that was the first um, issue that I had. There was no long-term vision to marry those other issues that had already been addressed that many people had contacted me and had the desire to have, especially the auditorium at Oakville. Second of all, Prop R did not address our debt. We have $60 million worth of debt. We pay $9 million a year to service that debt. And in the next few years, that debt payment is gonna to balloon to 10 million, 12 million. And the debt carries on through 2029. I believe as a fiscally responsible person, we need to get down that debt. Lastly, when I saw some of the punitive tactics that were being taken, removing busing for kids to get to school under a mile, uh, taking uh, clubs away, and then lastly, no computers for seniors. I could not support that. Um, those items totaled probably, aside from the computers, the buses and the clubs were about $230,000. Um, right now, we have a positive adjustment on our budget of $4 million. <laughs> our budget is positive $200,000. So those numbers were not accurate at the time, and my constituents depend on me to tell them the truth. So in the end, that was the biggest reason why I could not support it. Thank you. So we'll change gears here a little bit, looking through these questions, move to, I guess, what you'd consider a couple more social issues, I guess, beginning to uh, face schools and school districts throughout the country. So this question is, do you believe that transgender students should be able to use the restroom and locker room of their choice or that is designated for their actual gender. Does that question make sense for you, Laura? Yes. All right. Every student has a right to go to the restroom that represents their own physical gender. Um, I believe that restrooms, we, I mean, here's, here's the truth. This is an issue that um, is being discussed among all districts. In fact, Parkway School Districts uh, has had lots of information on this lately. I believe that every student should be provided a restroom, but that every child has rights to be protected too in the district. Sure. Do you believe that transgender students should be able to use the locker room of their choice? Mm -hmm. Or do we need to provide, or does the school need to provide a locker room specifically for a transgender child? They can provide means for them, but they should, um, not be able to share a locker room with a gender <laughs> of the opposite gender. Thank you. Yeah. This is a tough one. Uh, as a person just running for this, you can imagine how, how thrilled I am on this one. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I've actually done some research on this one, and it, it's not a great answer. So there is federal law on this. Uh, the state's a little bit mushy as far as which way they go, at least from what I've been able to find. Uh, the whole thing about if they're a child, a transgender child, having their own restroom and locker room facilities, um, if they agree to that, then that's an option. You can do that legally, and quite frankly, that would be an option I would support. Um, but if they don't, now you're into a whole bunch of legal issues, and essentially we're going to need legal counsel at that point. Uh, whatever we end up doing, we need to have respect for everybody that's involved with this. And that means a uh, child who is transgender and also means everybody else around them. This is obviously something that is it's a very sticky situation. It's, it's going to be very difficult and going to take a lot of, uh, what do you say, it's going to take some focus and effort to make sure that we get it right. So it's not an easy answer. From my research, there's about as much, there's kind of a conflict all over the place. Um, the, first, the first thing we have to consider is Title IX. 
which gives a transgender student the right to make a choice on what they're gonna use for facilities. However, there's almost no state law, there's almost no case law. We also have the issue that we have a responsibility to the students in our school who are underage that cannot make any consent in this area to protect them. Now, we had a similar situation over in Hillsborough. The Missouri School Boards Association got heavily involved in that and drafted policies that they have made available. Uh, the three members of the board here who sit on the policy committee have those documents and uh, we, we're going to sit down and look at those and we want to discuss those with Dr. Gaines at a, at a mutually agreeable time. If this situation comes up, we would seek legal counsel because we're going to have to look at the particulars specific to Melville to see what we would do. Hang on to that, Larry. Got another, got another social one coming at you. It says, do you believe that creationism should be taught in, it says Melville schools, but let's just say public schools, one and the same. According to what I've seen in the, in the state standards, <coughs> Creationism is not create is not designated as a science. So you have the issue of from that perspective, do you teach it as science or do you teach it as, as theology or history? Uh, from what I've looked at, it would appear to me that it should be either a theology or a history course because it's not consistent with the principles of science, at least as defined in the uh, in the standards in the state. Yeah, I guess I could just make this easy and say uh, what Larry said, but uh, <laughs> there is a, a state thing with this where, you know, the creationism is part of science curriculum. That's not not a piece of it, but uh, theology, yeah, it definitely fits in that. And I, I went to Marquette University, my, my first college, and one of the classes I had there was theology. And we actually got into this where uh, we went through every different philosophy and, and thought process, you know, with some of the great thinkers throughout time. And those are awesome classes. And something like this in a class like that would fit perfectly. But when it gets into science, there are rules in place that keep that from happening. I believe that evolution, creation, intelligent design, it should be offered as an elective course. Evolution is one theory. Creation or uh, intelligent design is another theory. I think public school needs to remember it represents their community. From that community, you have people from differing um, ideologies, and that family should be able to decide what elective, when it comes to those topics, their child should take. Way to keep that, Lori. <clears throat> so we're going to change gears again, and we're going to say if you are elected for, for the next three or three year term, what are, and, and there's not a number here, list a priority or list a few of the priorities that you would pursue as a member of the board? Well, I, three years ago, I ran with the priority of academic excellence. I will continue to strive for that. Our, our ACT score is 20.3. That's not acceptable to me. Our scores have room for improvement. We have strengths in our system, and I just want to be a part of building that and making that stronger so those so the children in this district can have doors open to them for the future if it's university college or workplace that they are the best and i'm also obviously a voice for fiscal responsibility i would continue to uh, strive to pay down that debt uh, prioritize our spending so that in the end in the next eight to ten years we can have uh, an influx of income that will be helpful for our vision. And lastly, I am a voice. I will continue to secure traditional values in public education. If elected, I'm counting on you guys. All right, uh, first thing for me is prop our commitments. Those have got to be met. I was one of the people that was putting the information out there on the Facebook page and communicating that with the community. I've got skin in this game. Prop our commitments have got to be met. Uh, open and transparent communication is an absolute must. We saw what happened when we were able to communicate with the community what was really happening, what the situation was, and how the community stepped up with 73% support. Academic excellence, that's why we're all here, right? And that's why we're running for the school board. Uh, we know that K-3, to early childhood, we've got some room for improvement. We know we can do pretty decent on career and college readiness, but we can do better. 
Uh, fiscal responsibility, that's a huge one for me. As I talked about before, I am a fiscal conservative. Uh, and we do need to look at the debt, but there's an interesting thing with the debt. We have about, kind of as Lori said, it's actually about $55 million in debt right now. What's uh, interesting is we ramp up a little bit to $13.4 million in payments in 2019, but after five years, we drop to 10% of our current debt payment. So we go from $8.4 million this year to $822,000 in 2022. If my home mortgage dropped 90% in six years, I would be so happy. Um, so when we're looking at the debt, I think we need to keep in mind what's really going on with it and where it's at and uh, and use that as a judge for how we go after the future. Surprisingly, Prop R is at the top of my list too. I think we have an opportunity to do something so squeaky clean the people trust us and continue to trust us as they did, at least 72% did. Second thing I think is we need to make sure that all of our decisions and all of our funding meet the three criteria of the strategic plan. It's a student achievement, it's supporting the teachers, and it's running as an efficient and effective an organization as possible. I think we've also got to, what I want to see us do is what we're doing in Prop A as an example. I want us to get away from long-term debt and start to build into our budget, as as Marshall Crutcher, our CFO, would say, he wants to see an even line every year of what our expenses are going to be for those type of capital expenses, and over time, they'll average out. I think we've got to continue the dialogue with the community. I think that has to be a priority of whoever's on the board. What we saw in the last two years, we have a dialogue now. We also have a $55 million set of capital needs that we've identified. We will need the community's help to prioritize that. There's already efforts in place to have people come into the schools and look at the specific issues. And over the next year, we'll get a better idea. And then we'll know what we want to do. And I think finally, I think we want to put more attention on the classroom. Because if we look, one of our issues last year was the exodus of teachers. And we saw things there wasn't classroom support, there wasn't materials. Uh, there were concerns about uh, extra, extra uh, services. Salary to some degree, but also it was the, the main concern seemed to be the uncertainty in our financial picture. We've clarified that dramatically with Prop R. So I think those are the things that someone elected would have to do. Hang on to that, Larry. While that question, yeah, just hang on to that. Do you have something else to say? Hey, uh, so while that question was looking forward, we're going to look backwards. And while it applied to you, two of you, as a current board member, or I know you've been involved with other things, Kevin, what was your greatest accomplishment regarding the Melville School District? I think the greatest accomplishment, and I have to kind of clarify this, because I believe the school board's a team game. I don't believe if any one individual is standing up, I think it gets in the way of process. I think my greatest accomplishment is I've become developed expertise in terms of how the district operates, how its finances work, but also I've spent a lot of time learning to be an advocate for public education, both here and in Jefferson City. I think my contribution is I'm able to provide insight and information and encourage other people to talk, because I believe leadership is about six-sevenths listening and about one-seventh talking, and I think that's Probably my greatest contribution is to adapt to boards, find out how to work with them. In terms of accomplishments, the things I pr I'm proudest of are the boards, Old Day Kindergarten, the Auditorium, Dr. Ritter, the Data Deck, what we did with the Strategic Plan, Dr. Dr. Gaines, and Prop R. And the fact that we've already, according to the plan, have 10 new buses coming in next year. So as you said, I haven't been on the school board, so i got to run this one a little bit differently. Uh, my greatest accomplishment in the school district was being part of Melville Local United and uh, being part of the team that helped to communicate to the community so that they had all the information they needed to pass Prop R with, with the way they did. Um, personally, for me, I didn't know anything about campaign committees or doing any of that 12 months ago. Um, I learned all of that on the fly, doing the research, uh, working with a, a great group of people that 
uh, in addition to, to everything that we were able to do, a, a bunch of people just starting from scratch and figuring it out as we went, um, you know, we actually passed it with 73%. And that's an accomplishment that, quite frankly, is going to be with me for the rest of my life. Nobody can ever take that away. And uh, everything I learned during that time, it, it's amazing to me. It's, I became a better person through that whole thing. It used a lot of my abilities, but it also stretched me to a point that I hadn't been before. Um, and that's about it. I'm just going to make one last comment on that, too. The friends that I met through that were uh, friendships that are going to last forever, too. It's, it's going to be one of the greatest experiences probably in my life. My biggest accomplishment that I'm most proud of uh, begins uh, in February of 2013 when I walked into my first Board of Education meeting. And I saw a group of people applauding scores um, that were basically in the 60s, which left 40% of our students <coughs> at a basic level. That was the beginning of going home thinking to myself, that just doesn't sound good to me. So I'm pr most proud that I continued being a voice for academics in this district and that people are now talking about academics and they are looking at those results, they are looking at those scores, and they are looking at how we can improve our system to have a better outcome. It's one reason why I'm proud. The second of all is I'm most proud that I kept my word back in 2013 to my constituents to be truthful and honest, to share information I received, no matter what situation I was in, even in some of the most difficult situations, I stayed true to my word that I gave them. Amen. We hear the phrase bandied about lately, uh, destination district. So the question would be, what is your definition of a destination <laughs> school district? And do you believe the Melville, that Melville is on that right track or, or, or a destination district today? For me personally, and this will differ, that makes public education, that's why we all have differing opinions. For me, a destination the district is a district that continues to uh, strive for academic excellence. We see in the state of Missouri, many schools, districts have gold star schools. Um, that's just not taking our high-end students. Part of that involves taking that middle student, those kids that they call kids in the middle, helping to give them an appetite through the system for learning. So those who are not learners automatically, that they desire to learn. And ultimately, we have this saying in our house that you'll become the average of your five closest friends. So I believe that a district who is strong in academics, strong in vision, will, will um, influence those other students that may be struggling. Do I think Melville is on that way? Um, I hear lots of conversations. I'm grateful for uh, the strengths that I see in our district. Um, and I look forward to them growing uh, towards that direction. I hope, my hope is, even though we've had much talk about School of Innovation, that School of Academics will get just as much attention. And um, that would be my direction for the district. Uh, definition district. So a year ago, I had no clue what that was. People banning it about in these meetings, and I finally just had to ask. And uh, so I think the definition, and I buy into this, it's a district where people want to move there because of your school systems and the facilities, basically access to things that are there. So from a school district perspective, they want to move to your district to be in your schools. I think we are on that track. Uh, I think when such a majority of people supported Prop R that there was a general feeling, even around St. Louis, of people saying, wow, they really support their schools, which was kind of interesting because we had been told before that 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 wasn't the case. And we had, I won't say it was evidence that it was the case because uh, there were some other things that went on and some, some previous tax things that I won't get into because I don't know them firsthand, but people drew that conclusion. I think Prop R proved when we go at it, we communicate clearly and we're reasonable, this community wants to be winners. They don't want to be second place. They don't want to be losing all these benefits that we have from living in this great community. We want to maintain that, and we want to get better. Uh, so I think we are on track for it. I don't think we're, we're maybe we're partly there, but until uh, people have six months waiting periods to get homes in this district, then we'll know that we've actually arrived. It's a little bit tongue in cheek. Back down. Well, I chose Melville as a destination district in 1993. 
uh, my kids attended Green Park Lutheran School, and we took a serious look at all their opportunities for high school. We made a conscious decision to come to the Melville School District because of the diversity, and we did it because of the curriculum. Why were we attracted to it? Word of mouth, how successfully the district had handled, handled desegregation as opposed to Lindbergh, which had a terrible problem the first three or four years. Who knew they'd be so good? Whatever. Mm -hmm. But the same qualities that drew me here, I think, are the things we are doing today. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting positive attention. We're being held up as, this is a great opportunity. Look what this district has done. I'll give you <coughs> another example. Every year, the Missouri School Boards Association has an annual conference. The day after we passed Prop R, I had 20 phone calls from people I know across the state and other school boards that wanted to know, how in the world did you do that? We're already booked. We don't to have to do a presentation in, in October. We will probably have one of the salons, we may have two, because they think we'll have two or 300 people come and listen to us. So we're doing something right there. The other thing is the real estate people will tell you that things are picking up. Because remember, it was, it was Dave Townsend that kind of kicked off the whole process when he talked about what the financial realities were of property values. Those have changed. So I think that, with what we talked about with student achievement, the diversity, the curriculum we have, I think we're on the way. Uh, one of you guys brought up the phrase choice school of innovation, and that I saw that on a question here. So we're going <coughs> to... We're going to, the question is, what do you think about the proposed school of innovation that might open next year? What I like about the idea is it's another opportunity for a different learning method for, for kids that may not be real good at, at rote, they may not be real good at lecture, they may, may not be real good at hearing, but the ability to craft things together and build them are important. But this isn't a new idea. I think it was my oldest son's, it would have been his, his junior year, in, in out, I think it was pre-calculus. They put together two and three man teams of kids that really understood it, ones that didn't, and took kind of a problem-based approach on, okay, you've got this project, how are you guys gonna do this? And it worked extremely well, especially for the kids that were struggling, just the fact they could work with a peer. The fact that we're gonna give kids another opportunity and it's not for everybody. It's going to be by lottery. It's going to be selective. But if people are inclined to that, I think it's a great idea. I know as a manager at Bell, before I retired from there, one of the greatest difficulties we had were people who could get in a room, two or three, and play nice together and be able to get something done without yelling because everybody wanted to do it their own way. The problem-based Everybody has a stake in it, and it's a collaborative environment, and it's very true to the real world. Can I tell you a little bit about my, my early education? So up until about eighth grade, I had a little bit of a difficult time in school because I didn't understand exactly what I was doing in school. Uh, when I was between kindergarten to seventh grade, it was kind of one of these things, why do I have to come here? Why do I have to color this map? What am I doing? Um, it was somewhere around eighth grade that I started to figure out the whole way that school works and how there's, there's these things that eventually leads to a career and all that. And then my grades really started to go up, and I even ended up getting into a master's program. So uh, obviously I figured it out, but what I really like about this Choice School of Innovation is this is a problem-based learning environment. That's what I do. As an engineer, I'm a problem solver. Uh, with my work in continuous improvement, I'm a problem solver. A lot of the world is problem solver. That is a great thing to get into early on. So when we're in school a lot of times and we're learning all these things, how does it apply? In a school like this, you're applying it as you're learning it. The retention for that is going to be so much better. There's something about in a lecture you retain like 5% after five days or something like that. If you are involved with it and do something with it, it's around 80%. If you teach it, it's around 90%. Uh, this is a great way also to have learning retention. And so from that aspect, I think it's great. But it doesn't displace traditional education. Most of our school, all the rest of our schools, are still going to be traditional education. This is 300 children in a, one specific spot. But everyone still benefits. There's training that goes along with this. 
we're doing something different, so you're going to have innovation. Best practices are going to be shared among the other schools. This is going to lift everybody, but it is not going to displace traditional education. But it's going to give kids another way to learn, and a lot of them may benefit from them. I can tell you I'm one of them that would have. Okay, so this is the fun part about being on the school board, or not so much fun. Um, everybody on the board, we're seven elected people, and we bring our own, um, you know, desires. We represent our constituencies. As I told you earlier, being on the school board really allows you to dig in and to, you know, really uh, thoughtfully uh, make some decisions and choices. So first off, let me say about School of Innovation. I believe the techniques, the project learning, I think some of that is being incorporated into our STEM um, curriculum, and I think there is a place for that. I think that um, has been an exciting learning opportunity. Um, concerns. First of all, uh, we have had these cuts, or mentioned cuts. Uh, Prop R did not address a new school of innovation, so that would be a concern. And I guess I should just preface my answer by saying these are concerns. There are a lot of questions still out there. There are a lot of answers that we are waiting to receive. I believe Dr. Clark um, is just a sincere educator uh, with great desires uh, to the future. My other concerns, though, when you start digging into the School of Innovation, um, you see the, the, every, the author of it, the movie that's been playing, um, he's got some political ties, and that's a concern to me. School districts are supposed to be local control, local decisions. Um, he has been assigned to the United Nations General Assembly by Barack Obama, which kind of tends to tell you that it's looking for a global education, which is different than what education should be a local control. So those would be some of my concerns that I would have, and I look forward to hearing more about it. All right, keep that, Lori. Um, Larry, Larry had brought up the term VICC students, and that's actually on one of these questions. I know there's been a, some stuff in the paper about that lately. So this question, to, to suck it down a little bit, is basically, is this a program you are in favor of continuing, increasing, or uh, abolishing? Uh, VIC stands for Voluntary Interdistrict Choice Corporation. I, again, learned that through my board service. Um, and as those who have followed my uh, career on the board will know that I'm not in favor of VIC um, for a variety of reasons. If you take a look at St. Louis City Schools and the results that they have, they have declined to a point of... Uh, really unacceptable conditions. I have seen not many school districts or the Vic Corporation uh, make any efforts to improve those districts. Um, instead, we, uh, the, the corporation takes money from their system, $7,200 a student, and brings them out here to different county schools. I believe that that money would be better served, say, in their district. I also would believe that going back to you'll be the average of your five closest friends, some of their top performing students are removed. And I just believe 30 years of basically busing, legalized and not legalized, uh, something needs to change because it's not being effective for uh, St. Louis City Schools. So I would like to see some of that money and effort be back, put back into their system so that St. Louis City children can have the opportunity that our county children have. Uh, so I, I do support the VIC program. And, you know, what Lori just said about if the St. Louis schools, in fact, are, are not improving those schools, then quite frankly, that's a moral and ethical issue that uh, they really need to deal with. Um, education, it levels the playing field. This whole country were based on equal opportunity and, and competitive, right? That's what capitalism is about. Education is the key to that. That's the base. That's where everybody starts from. So it's very important that our schools give children that base to basically be on a level playing field with everybody else. So what's interesting about Vic is I actually asked my son about this, who is an eighth grader at Oakville, uh, Oakville Middle School. 
And what he told me was, you know, the, the kids that were from Vic, they were there from day one. We never, we, he said we didn't even know for a couple of years that they didn't live in Melville. So they just integrated right in as one of the other students. Culturally, they were right with them. And the great thing about getting them on day one is you can get them to grade level when they're there from day one. Uh, what happened with Riverview Gardens, where we got them in all the way up through high school, if they're already behind at that grade level, now you've got that challenge of trying to get them to grade level. And with the big children, we don't have that. So uh, I do think this is a good program, and we should continue it. Just as a point of reference, Vic started as a court order, a desegregation court order back in 1983, which I believe was completed in 2003, and Vic has continued since then. Um, I'm in favor of it because it creates opportunities for kids. I'm in favor of it because money by itself, going back to St. Louis City, does not change poverty and does not change the basic fundamentals of what they're doing. I, from what I understand, from what I know of the numbers in St. Louis, they are getting better. Dr. Adams has done some spectacular work, but he's taken some different approaches. He has some schools on the north side that run 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or community centers. They've adapted. Um, but much like Kevin was saying, the Vic students that my kids went to school with, you didn't, you didn't know it. They studied hard. They worked hard. It was, a, it was a plus for everyone. It was part of the diversity that I think that made Melville stronger as a district than some of the other districts around us. For extra points, Larry, do you remember the name of the judge who instituted the busing? <laughs> Actually, he was, the, he was the substitute judge for the Hungate. William Hungate, that's he, right, Larry. He was, he was the All lowest right. priority judge and got the case. Now you're, now you're bragging. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be leaving. <laughs> I believe this count is right. Uh, in the 10 years preceding February of 06, it said the Melville School District has had approximately six superintendents or temporary superintendents, which would seem like quite the turnover. So this question asks, do you agree with current superintendent Dr. Gaines' ambitious plans for the district, and have you ever disagreed with anything that he has done? I think what he is doing is exactly what we expect him to do when we voted to hire him. We saw a man with experience. We saw a man who had taken school districts and helped them get better at what they do by using data, the continuous improvement, process improvement, knowing how things work and how to measure them and make them better. And I think he has come in here with ideas to challenge us to have people take a look at how are we doing things and by throwing some different, some curveballs at us, how would we react? I'm not sure disagree is the word. I think it takes us a while to, what, to really understand what the implications are from a government's perspective of the finances. But my experience is that if you promote an idea and give people time to germinate it and come up with the details, which is what we have, which he's been very good at, giving us timelines and, and details. I think he's doing exactly what we asked him to do, and that's to, if we're going to be a destination district to move forward, we have to adjust our thinking to really examine how well are we doing things. <coughs> Ten years, six superintendents, that is, that is a lot. Um, that's not good having that kind of turnover. Wow, um, you're taking for my time. Um, so, to, <laughs> to I agree with Dr. Gaines on his ambitious plans, um, I like the phrasing of that, by the way, but uh, yes, in general, I do. Um, I don't think that you do great things by having mediocre plans or tentative plans. I think you have to look at where do we want to go to, and you shoot for something that, that means something. Then you've got to develop an implementable plan. Uh, you need to have the steps to get there. And what's interesting is if you go back to January 7th and you look at that school board meeting and you look at the plan that Dr. Gaines put out there, um, I don't know if everybody caught this or not, but the way that is laid out, um, you can see where one thing happens, has some time to make sure that if there's any issues with it, it gets fixed, and then we move to the next one. We start to roll things out. That is a very pragmatic plan. Um, 
and I don't know if everybody caught it, but probably because of my continuous improvement and project management experience I did, I expect I will disagree with him in the future, sorry, but I'm sure it's going to happen. Um, and I'm not going to be shy about saying it when that does happen, but there's a thing about it. You can do that respectfully, and you can work towards a better solution. A uh, school board can't be made up of people who are just going to say yes all the time. You have to bring your own ideas, your own experiences. When you have seven different views on things or seven different histories, and you talk about those in a constructive way, you come up with better answers. And that's exactly what I think we need to do, and that is what I would do. Yes. As we know, Melville has had many superintendents, um, and I think that they all have uh, brought ambition for their vision, and I include Dr. Gaines in that. I think he is ambitious, and he has brought a vision uh, that is meaningful to him, and it's bringing that, um, educating the district on what that would look like. And yeah, I agree um, that there are going to be disagreements from time to time, and it is about respectfully disagreeing, and it's about respectfully honoring other people's opinion. Sometimes on school districts, people really struggle uh, with a differing opinion. I always say, uh, being in law or being a court reporter, as I am, <coughs> lawyers might go at it for hours for the whole day, but at the end of the day, they shake their hands and they probably walk out to their cars that are parked near to each other. I see education really struggles with people who have different opinions. Hang on to that. This next question asks, should the district set up an accountability portal? Or we could call it a transparency portal. I believe this would be something where on the Melville School's website where people, anyone, press, residents, businesses <laughs> can go on there to see uh, the expenditures, salaries, wages, pensions, etc. Yes, Aaron, I think you're the connection for that, right? <laughs> Has anybody been on the, uh, the Melville Fire Protection Department transparency portal? Too mouthful to say. Yeah. If you haven't, go to their website. It is a great transparency portal. And in fact, I think the state of Missouri even uses a similar, if not the same, method of reporting transparency uh, with their uh, finances, warrants, it's got everything listed. So check it out, and I would love to see Melville have that. Well, I think you can very well disagree with the, uh, the host program, can you? Um, <laughs> I just read the questions, I don't write it. I got gotcha. you. No, I actually have gone out to that site, and I love it. Um, so what you've got out there is this pie chart that shows you what all the spending was for the previous year, which, you know, the thing about transparency is it's not necessarily always that people are trying to hide things, but when you make it clearly visible, and pie charts are clearly visible, you can look at that thing, and I, I forget the exact one, but I think insurance actually was the biggest cost that came out on there. You can easily look at that, click on it, and get into things. Um, I actually didn't see uh, compensation on that one, but maybe it was on there and I just missed it. But... The interesting thing is, all of that does exist, it's just not in that format if you go to the Melville School District page. And I know this because I've gone out there, i pulled all that stuff down. The reason I can tell you 84% of uh, the budget last year was uh, teacher compensation is because all of that's out there. The warrants are also out there. Now, I didn't know that we used this term for it, but when I opened the thing up, all of the um, purchases that were made for the prior month are listed under warrants, which is in the area that is with school board meetings. Um, so all of that is there. It simply becomes a matter at that point of, uh, well, if you do it in Excel, and because I've done a ton in Excel with data, I can do it in about five minutes. Uh, you do insert pie chart, and you grab the data, and you can actually put the thing right there. So I think it's great what you guys, what the fire department has done with that. It's very easy to read. Uh, it's very tra transparent, very clear. So I definitely would be in favor of something like that. I think the details just come down more to how do you implement something like that? Do we do it outside? Do we do it inside? Well, he stole my thunder about pie charts. Sorry. That's okay. <coughs> There's no doubt that we need scorecards and, and dashboards, which give people a quick idea of where we are in terms of any point in time. One of the bigger issues I have is not with the, not with the fire district's approach to this, is the fact that I think Melville as a district needs to take a more, more serious look at information. And doing something like this, I think in concert with what we do with just the sheer volume of data that we have, 
would, would tie in together. I'm not sure that our volume lends itself to just a pie chart analysis. I think it's part of it, but I think there has to be other places where people can come in and almost ask questions and get answers. From a, using public money, we also have to consider how much is this going to cost us if we want to put that type of a very robust tool together. But do we do? But do we need this? Yes. All right. Thanks, Larry. Hang on to that. Um, I think we're probably down to about a few more questions here. I'll try to consolidate a lot of these. This one might be a, a larger question for you, but they keep coming up to things about the school board. Um, so basically, I'm going to just do it as two. If, if that's if we need to go over a little bit, that's all right. Because there's a lot. It says, what do you feel are the primary responsibilities of being a member of the board of education? And the second part is, it said, who do you represent? I don't know if this means various stakeholders as far as businesses, taxpayers, teachers, <laughs> students. Uh, certainly, you'd have some rope to uh, go at. Does that make some sense there? Yeah, rope is a bad word. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, anyway. In terms of responsibilities, there's three basic things the school board does. It's it has fiduciary responsibility for the tax levy, for the community's money. It has responsibility to operate the school. And usually that's done through the hiring of a superintendent that understands that business. Third thing we do is we get together as a group and we are legally authorized to operate. The responsibilities of an individual school board person is first of all, to get elected, obviously. The second thing is a lot of professional development because there is a lot to learn. And I think anybody that served on the board will tell you that. There's a certain culture shock when you get on. Somewhere between the three character abbreviations and just some of the terminology. But what an individual has to do is to have the drive to learn. They can't be spoon fed. They have to learn. That's the first responsibility. The second responsibility is you got to do your homework. You've got to come to meetings and be prepared. The third thing you have to do is you have to be out in, in your school community because your presence is where you will learn more about what parents think, how programs are going, and just to get a better feel. Now, when you have children in school, it's really, it's really a much, much different situation. In my case, my kids have all graduated. And I'm waiting for my grandson to start point in 2021, but that's another story. But that, that's the key thing for responsibilities. In terms of constituency, I believe I'm elected by the community to govern the school district and I believe the people I serve are the 10,500 children of this district. Everybody else has a political voice. You can vote me out, you can vote your representative out, but the kids can't. It's our job to make sure everything we do is for them. Well, that's it. Um, yeah, if you hear some of that a second time. Um, so academics, that's the main reason why we're all here, right? So. That's really for the children first and foremost to make sure that we're giving them the kind of education that they're going to be able to pursue their dreams, who they want to be when they grow up, um, what they want to accomplish, and let them know, you know, have the ability to do that and actually figure out what it is they want to do. So we've got to get that part right. So that's the primary one. Second one is fiscally responsible. Um, that gets into making sure that we focus our resources on the areas that drive academics, uh, that make sure that we're setting our kids up right, and also rooting out waste. We need to constantly be looking at our processes and figuring out how do we make these better, uh, where can we eliminate wasteful costs that aren't going towards the goals that we have, that aren't meaningful towards those. Um, so it, it really comes down children first and community. Uh, community, we're, we're using taxpayer dollars. As I said before, when you're using somebody else's money, I think you need to treat it even more carefully than you would your own and need to make sure that you're doing the right things with that. Because uh, it's not just your own money that you're, you're wasting at that point. You're wasting a whole heck of a lot of people's money. So, uh, children and community. Well, our role as a school board member, uh, first off, begins, um, you know, you, uh, you represent your community. That is the adults. That is the children. Uh, you're responsible with funds. Uh, responsible for the allocation of the funds and making sure that you are transparent um, with your community. 
But also an important role is hiring the superintendent. When we talk about MEVO, the trans uh, transition of superintendents, that's a very important role for the MEVO school board uh, for a director. Um, we also, the people that I represent, I would, I would say, people I represent are those constituents who know, who desire that destination district and know that academics, the importance of academics in getting there. And the reason why it's important to them is because of their children. And that ultimately, like these three gentlemen said, it is about the children. It is about what, what they are going to be um, given what system are they going to be um, provided so that they will be able to compete with the rest of what St. Louis County offers, what the rest of Missouri offers, and what the rest of our country offers. That's who we need to be committed to. They deserve a first-class education. Um, and thank you. Hang on to that, Lori. We're down to two. <laughs> this one regards, um, I guess you call it teachers or administrator pensions. Um, said approximately about five years ago, there was an editorial in the local paper that talked about when the superintendent of Melville, who previously had retired, Terry Noble, would receive $550 a day for the rest of his life as part of his pension from in his mid-50s. This ignited about eight weeks of letters from either side to the editor and quite the stir. So the, it segued into, do you see any issues with the current system of teacher or administrative public pensions in Missouri, and if you do, do you advocate any changes? That's a big question to end up with, right? Oh, one, one more. Okay. Uh, boy, uh, this is uh, a question being discussed, talked about. It's interesting, again, going back to having the desire to learn about systems. Uh, this is an area that uh, I cannot claim to be an expert on, but I am learning some facts. Some of those facts are, one, the this PSRS was instituted by law in 1947. That's a long time ago. So uh, I would like to dig in a little more and see uh, some of the fundamental foundations of that law. Second of all, when we talk about pensions, and we talk about the big program in the city schools, what I find interesting is that St. Louis City and Kansas City have a different pension system in St. Louis County. It almost makes me wonder uh, if that has any effect of the decline of the schools in St. Louis City because I've heard over the years teachers don't want to basically cross the line to go down there because of the pension. Thirdly, because of the hours um, that this the pension does dictate that you are only able to work, I believe it's 500 or 550 <laughs> once you're retired, that's also another measure that, uh, that discourages maybe some of those uh, retired teachers of going into some of those neighborhoods that could help change the system in the city. So I do think there are uh, quite a few areas that maybe could be looked at to see if there's any improvement that could be had. I got into the wrong career. Uh, $550 a day, holy smokes. <laughs> it was a day, right? A year. No, yeah, a day. $550 a day. Yeah. yeah. 550 hours is the most they can work in a year. Right. I'm still in the wrong career. Yeah. All right. Um, so the question came down to if we should have any changes with this system. Uh, quite honestly, that one, I probably want to look at that a little bit. In general, when you're talking about teachers, uh, the way this works is they put 14.5% of their salary into this plan. That's 14.5% of their money. That's like us putting our money into an IRA. The district puts in 14.5%. Uh, they don't put in Social Security, so I think that's about 6.2%, so you knock that one out, and they also don't ever get Social Security on the flip side of that. We also don't have a 401k plan, so generally there's some sort of matching that goes along with that. This 14.5%, very nice, yes. Um, is it outlandish? I don't know that I'd go that far, and it's not an unfunded liability. The teachers are also putting in 14.5% of their own money into this system. Is it great once you get to retirement? Sounds like it. Um, but you know, at this point, I wouldn't suggest a change to it, and uh, maybe for superintendents that have already retired, but we'll look into that later. I haven't seen the numbers for this year, but I believe last year the pension was funded at about an 80, 82% level, which is held up as one of the best ones in the nation. 
there's a lot of money that goes in from each teacher, 14.5%. Now, what I don't know, and I looked at the same law, but I don't know if that ex was because they were excluded from Social Security or if there was some other consideration that made that this had to be created. And I suspect St. Louis and Kansas City, because at one time they were probably the major drawing point in their in their heyday, that it drew people and it was it was an attractive thing. It just couldn't stay up. Um, it would we would have to do a lot of work and a lot of figuring to figure out what would an alternative be. Right now it's funded, it's functional. The question would become if if much like we've talked about with Social Security, if there are too many people drawing and not enough contributing, then that's an issue that we have to look at with the fund. All right, hang on to that, Larry. We've got the last one. It could be really simple. It says, if you are elected, would you support another tax increase in the next three years? The answer is I don't know because I don't know what the outcome of the discussion of the $55 million shortfall, not shortfall, of the capital needs. What well, if we've learned anything in the last two years? It's you can't look ahead and figure out what the answer is before you get there. What we're, what is going to be necessary is to find out how do we do this? How successful are we with Prop R? Do we maintain the trust? Do we enrich it? Do we know what it's going to take to do building improvements? Do we are is our assessed value going to change? So I think I would the same way I would vote. I voted for Prop R. If a good business case is made, if we've exhausted funds or we have needs, and I think the capital problem more than any other, if the community tells us we should do it, then we'll do it. On this one, I really don't know either. Um, I'm not a fan of tax increases. That's despite what some people may think of getting involved with MOU, but... Um, I think there's a few things to look at. When we look at our overall debt and we see how that goes up and then drops to 10% of where it's currently at in 2022, and we know we got this $55 million in capital needs, we need to be looking through this at where are there, where is there waste or processes we can do better, things that we can do more with what we have before we think about going back to the taxpayers for a tax increase. And if we do, do, if we do look at going back to the taxpayers for an increase, we need to be looking at the best way to do that. And one thing to consider with that is rather than going for a large debt amount, that pay as you go that I mentioned before, with the schools already built, we don't have this huge cash outlay that we need to do to build something big. So a lot of our capital needs are going to be repeating. And if we can structure that in a way that allows us to go with a smaller pay as you go, kind of like the Prop A idea is, um, you know, financially, that could be better, and at the very least, it gets rid of the interest payments. Um, when I just look at this past year, uh, starting about eight months ago, when we were uh, projected to be eight point eight million, then it went to four point four million deficit, and now, right now. We're at two hundred thousand and a positive, uh, a positive uh, point in our budget, and the fiscal year isn't up yet. I think we need to remain. We need to sit back and see where the outcome of our funds are. That's one point. Second point is, is if you look uh, historically, you can just look into North County. They continue having tax increases. If you look at their rate, their rates are high. It did not affect their product. Their product is. Um, you don't see the outcome that uh, really uh, coordinates with their tax increase. And thirdly, I've often said, because we have a lot of comparison in this area, I've grown up here and I've heard the comparison my whole life, if they would have just drawn the borders different, if we would be in Jefferson County, everybody in Jefferson County would be looking at us saying, wow, look at them, look how much money they have, look at what they spent. Nothing, our location is not going to change, and districts need to really work with what they have. It's possible with the passage of Prop R, we have a 114 million dollar budget that is unheard of. The kind of money that is being put towards education, you know, if you look at when education began to exist as we know it today, 
when the Department of Education came in the 1970s. You can see a correlation of, um, of expenses increases but results decreasing. I think we need to take be a district that starts taking a look at that and changing that trajectory. Anyone on the microphone? We we yes, we, we did okay. good. We pretty much went through all the the questions here, and uh, so now we have our closing statements. And each one of you will have three minutes for that, Deb. And so we're going to start and go in the reverse order of the opening. So floor is yours, Lori. Uh, there has been information shared tonight. And hopefully there's been enough to light a spark in you as it relates to Melville School District and public education. It is now your turn to continue the process in educating yourself. As you can see, the candidates here vary differently. Over the next few weeks, the campaigns will intensify. And I would urge you to stay engaged. Learn for yourself. You'll be amazed at what you discover. Finally, I would ask parents, grandparents, and community members, in order to guarantee a board member who values a more classical education of reading, writing, and arithmetic, there's only one candidate, only one, to vote for on April 5th, and that is Lori Trakis. As I have demonstrated tonight, I am the crystal clear voice for academic excellence, fiscal responsibility, and integrity and a voice to secure traditional values in public education. I want to again thank the call, Andres, Aaron, and also everyone that, that came out to this tonight. Uh, being my first forum uh, has been quite the experience. So, uh, When I'm going to the polls, I'm going to decide who to vote for in an election. One of the questions I ask is, what do they bring to the table? Who has the most suited experience? Who has the skills to do that job? So I'm going to put forth for your consideration what I think are some of mine. I have a master's degree in engineering management from Syracuse University. I'm a certified project management professional. I have nearly 25 years of industry experience, with most of it being in project management, where I ran budgets of over $50 million. During those same projects, I managed large project teams, different disciplines, departments, even companies. These last four years, my career has been focused on continuous improvement, and in there I regularly lead teams in rooting out waste. School board members have to be able to bring people together. When you can be part of a team that brings together 73% of our community to support a tax levy, I think that shows the ability to bring people together. The last year has been an amazing journey for me. One year ago, I didn't know the first thing about a campaign committee or being a treasurer. I figured it out. When there's a challenge, I'll do the research to understand the problem, talk with and listen to the community, anyone who has an idea of how to do it better, and come to a logical, data-driven decision. That's just how I think. I believe that when you look at the current makeup of this board, a data-driven decision maker, or two data-driven decision makers, in 2016 is an excellent step to becoming an even better school district than we already are. I am extremely excited to have this opportunity to run for the school board, and humbly I ask for your vote on April 5th. Thank you. First of all, let me thank everyone who took time to either email or hand questions in tonight. Nothing like keeping us honest. I want to thank Andres for your hospitality, Mr. Homer for your work this evening, and the call newspapers for giving the community a chance to learn more about this year's board's candidates. Tonight we've talked about board candidates, and we've talked a little bit about what the board does, but to kind of restate it, the board has three main responsibilities. Financial responsibility, which we've talked out a great deal tonight, and that's taking prudent care of the community's money. We're charged with school operations and student achievement, and we do that through hiring a superintendent who understands how schools can be efficient and effective and how to continuously improve the way things are done. And third, we have authority as a group to make decisions to govern the school district. I mention that because each school board member by themselves really has no authority. It's only when we sit down together. For the board to be strong, each member needs to continue to learn more about the district and develop expertise and self-sufficiency. I will, I am, it doesn't happen, well, if it doesn't happen, you have a board that's only as good as its weakest member. And we spend time either having to catch them up or 
dealing with kind of false impressions. My main focus has been to continue to get better as a board member because I didn't want to be the, the, the number seven in the pecking order. In my nine years on the board, I've used my professional background in management, strategic planning, process improvement, databases, data analysis, whatever you want to form you want to get it into, to develop financial and operations expertise on how this district op works. I'm focused on the scope of our decisions that we make on the board because there is no such thing as an independent decision. This is what we've learned from the strategic plan. Everything we do touches something else, and we have to consider what I call horizontal thinking. I'm focused on the scope of the type of leadership we have. As far as myself, I believe six-sevenths of the time you listen and one-seventh you talk. I believe in leadership that starts with listening and contributing, not dominating. I've worked hard to be a strong advocate for the Melville School District and for public education in Missouri. I this, it did this to understand the impact of Jefferson City and what it does to our, our school district. I believe in leadership that starts with listening and contributing, not dominating. Today, there's an unprecedented level of cooperation with the Melville School District and the Melville and Oakville communities. It took intelligent board decisions to get there. It wasn't by accident. It took board members with a passion to learn and to serve. On April 5th, you will have the opportunity to vote for two people to serve you. You want to elect people who can follow the strategic plan and lead the district in the future. I believe I am qualified to meet that challenge. Please vote for me on April 5th, 2016. I'm number one on the ballot. Thank you for being here this evening. Well, we, to, to rehash, we would definitely would like to thank Andres for providing the facilities tonight. We'd like to thank Deb Baker and, and Bill Milligan at the call. I, I think a lot of times we people don't realize if you get out of South County, you never get a chance to read a local paper that really pulls back the, the curtain on what goes on in local government, much less give people a chance if they want to make an informed decision on something like a school board race. And, and quite honestly, there's not much more that affects your, your pocketbook or your way of life than your local property taxes you pay. And um, most of all, though, we'd like to thank the candidates because... I know that it's really easy for you know people to throw stones or to be critical or be that Monday morning quarterback, but whether we agree or disagree with what either of these three have to say or have done, it, it takes. A, I think they deserve your respect for taking the time to do this and put themselves out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, brother. That's it. Thanks, Lori. Oh, yeah, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> so did you, did you end up being able to get it on your phone? I, right on. Thanks. So I don't know. Um, yes.